Hi, this is Father Bill W. here in Austin, Texas. I am an alcoholic and in long-term recovery from alcoholism. And I'm also an Episcopal priest with a special ministry uh, devoted to alcoholics and addicts. Um, Welcome to the podcast. Uh, We have been working in this series on two-way prayer. Uh, If you listen to the last episode, it was devoted to a pamphlet that was written by a fellow by the name of Chaplain John Batterson, B-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N. And you can find that on our website, uh, twowayprayer.org. You can download it and, and have a copy there for yourself. And we went through that at some length. Uh, if you haven't listened to that episode, I'd encourage you to do that before we dive into this one. Um, it, it gives an explanation of who the what some of the Oxford group beliefs were, and then how they practiced this two-way prayer in, in the original form. Very, very helpful. Um, that was probably the, the pamphlet that was the most helpful to me when I first started doing this practice. But having done it over a number of years, I found that there was a need for um, maybe a a simpler pamphlet, uh, a simpler explanation of how to do it. I picked up a few uh, tricks of the trade, you might say, uh, from myself and from other people as we did the practice, things that uh, are helpful tips in, um, in having it be successful for you. And so what one thing I find people always struggle with when they're, when they're coming to this practice is, um, you know, is this really AA or is, is this something you're uh, getting out of California or, you know, where, where are you getting this thing? And so I, I include on uh, my little uh, two, two-page uh, reference sheet uh, some quotes from, um, well, two of them are from Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, which is an AA uh, publication, and I'd um, um, encourage you to read that if you want a good uh, place to start, get getting solid on the history. That is a wonderful, wonderful place to to begin. But here's a quote I found on page 136 of that book, and it's uh, it says the AA members of that time, and they're referring to that period. 36, 1936 through 1939, before the big book gets published, before the 12 steps even exist. So the people who are staying sober, uh, Dr. Bob, Bill W., uh, the other folks uh, in Akron, Cleveland, and New York, is, is referring to them as the AA members of that time, did not consider meetings necessary to maintain sobriety. They were simply, quote, desirable. Morning devotion and quiet time, however, were musts. So what they're saying there is in the beginning of this, uh, this movement, prayer and meditation were more important than attendance at meetings. Well, we've really, really gone far afield from that. Uh, right now it's meetings, 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 and uh, go to the wisdom of the rooms And, um, you know, sometimes that wisdom's a little shaky. Uh, And um, this this practice is going to shift your attention, uh, not away from meetings. Uh, Meetings are good. I still go to meetings. Um, I try to carry the message at meetings. um, And and we encourage people to do that. But prayer and meditation is where they found so much strength and guidance. Uh, in the beginnings of the program. Bill Wilson on page 178 of that book is quoted as saying this, I sort of always felt that something was lost from AA when we stopped emphasizing the morning meditation. Something was lost. And what is that something? I really believe that something is conscious contact, direct contact with God's voice, listening to it, writing down the thoughts that come to us during that practice, sharing those thoughts with other people, and feeling that intimacy with God. Uh, I'm pretty convinced that uh, addiction uh, has to do with relationships, that I am, uh, I know I was, uh, had walls around me. I was, I was isolated from other people. I was alone. 
and and while meetings were really helpful to me and uh, and and a big chunk of my early sobriety was was devoted to them when i found this uh, form of prayer and meditation um the intimacy with god and and subsequently the intimacy with other people just expanded tremendously so um uh, my guidance over the years has been to teach this form of prayer and meditation to people who are in 12-step fellowships. That's why we started the website. That's why I do workshops around the country. Uh, and that's why uh, we're, we're doing these podcasts as well. So uh, with that, by way of background, I wrote a little uh, two-page um, uh, cheat sheet, you might call it, on how to practice two-way prayer. Again, you can get that uh, from our website. So how to how to do the practice? Uh, first, preparation. Um, commit to having a quiet time with God for a minimum of, of ten minutes daily for thirty days. Now that may sound uh, hard, um, and and I guess it is, but but you know if you don't if you don't commit to it and if you don't follow through on it, uh, chances are the results are going to be very minimal. But if you do commit to doing it and you do show up consistently for a 30-day period, I think you're going to uh, have the, the experience that, uh, that can really genuinely change your life. Second piece is practice it each morning. Um, can you do it in the afternoon? Yeah. Can you do it in the evening? Yes. Uh, if the morning is out of, out of the question, okay. But Every prayer practice that I know of uh, encourages people to do it first thing in the morning. Get your cup of coffee, find a, a place where you can do it, and uh, and begin the practice. Consistent. Choose a sacred space. This is one that I've certainly added to the uh, original pamphlet. But what I've found is that if I have a space uh, where I can reserve it for my prayer, once I enter that space, once I sit down in a, in a chair that is set aside for my, for my quiet time, my mind more quickly goes into that space where it has access to God. It's just, just part of like getting ready. So if that's a possibility for you, if you can reserve a chair simply for that practice, I'd encourage you to do it. If you can't, uh, throw a, a blanket over the chair. Do something to mark it as special so that when you're sitting there, you know you're in your sacred space and you know that you're getting ready to listen for God's voice. Last thing on the preparation is, is buy yourself a, a little composition notebook. Have it sitting by your table and a pen or pencil there, and you are ready then to, to begin your practice. Now, for the practice itself, uh, sit in a comfortable upright position. Any any uh, book that you'll buy on prayer and meditation is gonna is gonna make some reference to that. You keep your spine in alignment. Uh, you're not slouched. You don't have your feet up on the table. You're ent we're entering into God's presence, and we want to we want to be attentive to that. <clears throat> and there's just something about having your spine in alignment with your brain so that so that there's a flow that is going uh, throughout your whole body. So sit comfortably, you know, uh, but upright. And you got to remember into whose presence you are coming. You know, you're entering into um, a little session with God. So you want to you want to uh, be proper in that. What they often did, and, and I recommend this as well, is read a short passage uh, from a source of literature that is sacred to you. Now, if you're a Christian, um, uh, as, as almost all of the um, folks who, who began this uh, back in the 30s were, um, to one degree or another, you know, um, you, you, you would go to your Christian literature. And, and there were three pieces of, of literature that they highly recommended, and I think this is very helpful. Uh, so the first one is the Sermon on the Mount, 
It's Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And these are the basic uh, principles that Jesus taught. And if you'll read through them, they are all ego-busting principles. And I think that's one of the reasons that they were so drawn to them. All of us uh, who are coming into recovery, we have ego issues, as we like to call them, that get in the way of uh, our, our relationship with God. And so just reading, um, I get I asked, how, how long do I read? And my answer to that is until it strikes you. Just read maybe a paragraph. This is, this, this is some heavy doses of ego-busting stuff. So just, uh, you know, read until something hits you and then meditate, which means to think deeply on those words for just a few moments. Hey, let them sink into you. Uh, So Sermon on the Mount, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Love is patient and kind, you know. You know, uh, uh, think about patience. Think about kindness. Love is never in a hurry, you know. Um, I'm in a hurry. Let that, let that sink in. Love believes all things, hopes all things. You know, do I, do I hope? Just, just sink deeper and deeper into that. And this is all before you get to uh, doing your two-way prayer practice. Just a few moments with uh, a sacred piece of scripture. And the third piece of scripture they recommended was the, uh, was, uh, the letter of James. Uh, five little chapters. Um, and so much of AA comes from that letter of James that they, in the beginning, before they chose the name Alcoholics Anonymous, many wanted to call it the James Club. Because, because they were practicing some of the uh, principles. You know, we talk about the principles. And uh, these, are, these are where the principles were coming from. So, uh, again, maybe a paragraph, maybe two. Just read it, sit with it, uh, chew on it, let it digest it, let it sink into you. Then take a couple of deep breaths. Let go of all tension and worry. If you, if you do any other relaxation exercises, whatever is helpful for you, uh, try doing those. That's, um, that's helpful. And then I, what I suggest people do is write a question. And as I've worked with this over the years, what, what I'm really doing at this point is I'm doing step 10. So I think this, this, this two-way prayer uh, work is really steps 10, 11, and 12 done on a daily basis and done very intentionally. So uh, I am taking my inventory. I look at myself internally. What's going on? Is there fear, anxiety, restlessness? Am I angry? Uh, Do I have a resentment? Um, Did I have a fight with somebody the other day? Is there something that stands between me and God? Something that stands between me and other people? Something that, that stands between me and my true self? Look inside, look outside. What's going on? What's going on? And be honest about it. That's the key, the key piece, that, that it's an honest reflection of, of what is happening. So, so what's troubling me? What's troubling me is, uh, uh, is the stance that I take with my, with my step 10. Um, so, and out of that, I write a question. So here are some examples of, uh, of writing a question. God I've tried getting clean and sober before. Please tell me what I need to do that's different this time. If you're already sober, uh, begin looking at other addictions or behaviors that are going on in your life, things that have you stuck, things that have defeated you, and ask for guidance with them. So what's in the way of my relationships? Another example, Heavenly Father, I'm feeling so alone. 
I feel separated from you, separated from others. Please help me feel your presence. Father, Mother God, I'm withdrawing again. I'm isolating, moving further away from my spouse or my child. Please tell me what I should do. Uh, final one, Lord Jesus or Spirit or my Creator, uh, Unknown God, Holy One, whatever name you are comfortable with in using uh, for God. Um, I need your guidance today because, boom, and then fill in the blank. I need your guidance because I'm facing something really serious. I'm meeting with someone. I'm making an amend. I'm uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a call today that's really important, and and I can get angry with this person. Please help me. Um, you just fill in the blanks. But the important thing is that this has to do with your life. What's going on? This is not what should I do if I want to be holy. This is how do I live in this world. Uh, dependent, relying upon that power greater than myself, okay? And again, use whatever name for God you're comfortable with, and you'll find, or I found over time, that these begin to shift and change. Um, so, uh, you know, if your spirituality is, is the same five years from now as it, as it is today, you're not growing. And, and so it needs to be alive. It, need, it needs to change. Okay, so I've written the question. So again, I consider that step 10. Then what do I do? I listen for God's voice. All right, listen for God's voice. Uh, so I've asked a question. Now my expectation is that God is going to speak to me. How is he going to speak to me? He's going to speak to me through my thoughts. And, and I encourage people to, in, especially in the beginning, feel free to use your imagination. If God were to speak, what would he say? All right? And, and, and one thing that I found tremendously helpful for this is I encourage people to use a term of endearment. And, and so you, you write down, my sweetheart, my darling, my beloved son, my child, my dear daughter, my precious one, some term of endearment that begins from God's mind, and now it is going to come into your mind. And um, uh, so you just write that down, and then as much as possible, just let it flow. Try not to think. Just begin to write. All right? Write the words that come. Don't try to edit them. Listen and write. If thoughts come that you think are not from God, write them down anyway. You know, put them in brackets if you like, uh, wh whatever, whatever you need to do, but, but just write. Just let it flow for a few moments, hey? And if you're stuck, you can uh, just go back and say, once again, my child, my precious, or some other term of endearment that, that you might uh, use. And then you stop writing when it becomes strained. So you might you might you might fill a page in your notebook. Uh, probably not much more than that in the beginning, two, three, four minutes, um, and then uh, feel the closeness of God. Thank Him for His presence, and um, you know whatever practices you use. If you want to close that with a particular prayer. That's fine. They would never give you, Oxford Group people, early AAs, would never say, this is exactly how you should do it, point by point by point. You know, it's your practice. It's your relationship. And uh, you're going to do it the way you want to do it. And that's the quiet time. So the quiet time is maybe 10, 15 minutes. But the two-way prayer is just a portion of that quiet time. So I've been, I've, I've written something down. Uh, it may be someone to call. It may be something to practice during the day. It, it may be something to be aware of during the day. Uh, it may be something to do. Um, um, what I do is if it's, if it's a specific piece of guidance, I put a little box next to it. And then uh, when I come back tomorrow, 
uh, I'm able to check off the box if I performed the, the piece of guidance. So here's, um, uh, here's, here's a quote from, from the big book, and see if this doesn't now make more sense to you. It's from the 11th step uh, section. And here's the quote, ask God to direct our thinking. We ask God for inspiration, an intuitive thought. What used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Being still in experience and having just made conscious contact with God, it is not probable that we are going to be inspired at all times. We might pay for this presumption in all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. Nevertheless, we find that our thinking will, as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration. We come to rely upon it. That's from page 87 in the big book. And I think, you know, when I read those words, and now I have an understanding of what the two-way prayer practice was all about, I get a much richer, deeper appreciation for what the big book is talking about there. That it was a time of of my coming to, to be in God's presence, bringing my problems to him or her, however my understanding might be, and then writing down the thoughts that come. Now, I want to talk a little bit about checking, because that was a part of their uh, process. It's possible for the mind to uh, certainly, and the ego, uh, to certainly intervene and put, put its own thoughts in there. So how do I discern if they are my thoughts or God thoughts? And, um, and this is where the absolutes come in. The four absolutes, honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. Um, uh, Here's here's Dr. Bob again. I want to quote from him. Because what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to put those thoughts that I've just written down on paper up to the test, the test of the four absolutes. Do they pass the test? Are the words honest? Are they pure? Are they unselfish? Are they loving? Are, are the instructions that I've been given to do, are they honest, pure, unselfish, loving? If they're not, what they would say is throw them out. They cannot be from God. But if they are, pay attention to them. So here's Dr. Bob. Uh, the four absolutes, as we called them, were the only yardsticks we had in the early days before the steps. I think the absolutes still hold good and can be extremely helpful. I have found at times that a question arises, and I want to do the right thing, but the answer is not obvious. Almost always, if I measure my decision carefully by the yardsticks of absolute honesty, absolute unselfishness, absolute purity, and absolute love, and it checks up pretty well with those four, then my answer can't be very far out of the way. Um... The, the absolutes are really, uh, and Wilson said he put those into step six and seven. So if you'll, if you'll think of it that way, six and seven is where, you know, we're looking at our defects of character, our shortcomings. We're trying to ask God's help in removing them to get rid of the blocks that get between me, other people, and, and my true self. Um, and, and that's the guidance that I'm, I'm going to receive. If, if you're looking for, uh, you know, how to bet on a horse through your two-way prayer, not gonna, I don't recommend it. <laughs> if, you're, if you're serious about trying to live a spiritual life and you're trying to look at how you're getting along with other people and how you're dealing inside with your, with your fears and insecurities and uh, all of that stuff, if you're, if you're a, a drunk or a drug addict or a food addict trying, trying to get sober and, and abstinent, uh, this is where the two-way prayer uh, is uh, is going to be so tremendously helpful. Um, so um, you check the guidance, and if you're, we're going to do a, a whole episode on this, how to use a prayer partner. 
but if you've, uh, if you've got a serious question, do I do this? Do I not do this? Uh, check it out with someone else who is listening to two-way prayer or check it out uh, with uh, someone who's quite spiritual uh, in, their, in their own practice and, and see what, uh, what they say about it, <coughs> particularly if it's a, if it's a big, a big uh, action that you have to do. And, and then um, if it passes all those tests, act on it. And that's really important that you act on it. Uh, their belief was, and, and my experience is, if I don't act on it, then the guidance is going to begin to dry up. And it makes perfect sense. If, if I won't let go of something or if I won't do God's will that I'm being asked to, asked to perform, why should he, uh, you know, keep, keep prompting me to do it, what I won't do? So there's, there's, a, there's a flow to this thing. If I'm, and that, see, that becomes tw- step 12. You know, having had this spiritual experience or awakening, uh, you know, we practice these principles in all of our affairs. We take this guidance and we put it to work in our lives. And I think you'll find if you will do this, and particularly if you'll do it for about 30 days, uh, you're going to find your recovery takes on a whole different dynamic than it ever had before. Now, uh, I just want to close with this because it's a question that I get all the time. And that is sometimes people ask me, how do you know it's really God? How do you know it's God's voice that you're hearing? Uh, How do you know it's not just you? And the answer that I've developed over the years is simply this. I really don't know. And in the end, I found it really doesn't matter. If it is not uh, God, if it is me, then I've discovered this. It's the very best part of me I've ever found. It's the part of me that wants good things for me. It's the part of me that wants to teach me how to love. It's the one, the part that wants to teach me to be honest. And if I begin listening to that and acting on that, I'm not going to get in too much trouble. And uh, God, I know all those ego voices inside. <coughs> Excuse me, the addict voice the self-critic, critical voice that uh, just hounds me. I know those voices. So what I've found over the years is this. There's another voice. <coughs> that, that voice loves me. That uh, I call that the voice of God. It wants only good things for me. And uh, if I begin listening to it and acting upon it and, and getting closer and closer to it uh, through the practice of the absolutes, I'm drawing closer and closer to God and closer and closer to my true self. As it says in the big book, when we drew near to him, he discloses himself to us. And I think one of the major ways that he does that disclosing is through the two-way prayer. So um, I hope you'll uh, download that material, um, get the uh, original pamphlet called How to Listen to God, and get this uh, little cheat sheet that I've developed called How to Practice Two-Way Prayer. They are on our Two-Way Prayer website. And, um, and then give it, give it 30 days. Um, commit to it. Do it. It's going to change your life. And I promise you it's going to be much, much for the better. So thank you for listening. Um, hope all is well with you and yours. God bless. Keep coming back.